All right. Welcome, everyone, to the September 2018 edition of Team Evil GSP question and answer video. I am B. Chavez. And as always, I will start this with uh, some questions that have come through earlier so that uh, we give a little time for an audience to build up. And actually, before I even do that, uh, I want to thank the guys at McMillan Training Centers in Lancaster, PA, for having me yesterday. Had a great fucking time. Uh, that is uh, a really, really good thing. If uh, anybody lives in the northeast of the U.S. and you get an opportunity to travel to the Lancaster, PA area, McMillan Training Centers, literally, I don't exaggerate, literally, my favorite strongman gym in the U.S., uh, it's just a great fucking place. Uh, not only is it a great facility with great equipment, but uh, it's a great bunch of people. It's people that just really, really love doing what they're fucking doing. And that matters. Uh, damn. I just, it, it's about a three hour ride for me. And literally, if I was still competitive, I would drive that distance every goddamn training day because it's just worth the trouble. Ah, uh, Brevin has signed on and said hello from California. Sir, how are you? Uh, anyway, on to a couple of uh, prepackaged questions. I, uh, these are just kind of random. Uh, actually, I want to speak on the whole question thing in a minute, but this one's at the tip of my tongue. Um, I didn't record your full name, but somebody named Brandon was asking me about uh, Chromium recommendations. And my, I answered him in email at some point but uh, I just thought it was a good little question. Yes, I definitely do recommend, especially with kind of my high-carb, high-calorie approach. Chromium can be uh, a log jam. It can be a thing that develops as a deficiency. I definitely think you should use Chromium, supplemental Chromium. Uh, chromium picolinate is essentially the only kind on the market anymore. In the past, there have been some other niclinate and a couple of others, but Chromium picolinate is pretty much all you get. And my general recommendation is between 50 and 100 micrograms per hundred grams of dietary carbohydrates. Uh, if you presently do not supplement your diet with chromium, I would start at the high side of that, 100 micrograms per hundred grams. And then after, say, six to eight months, because micronutrition, particularly minerals, are somewhat accumulative, after six to eight months, I'd probably dial it back to the lower side. But in, in an attempt to get caught up, if you will, and get um, kind of back to baseline, I would definitely start at the high end. Uh, chromium has an incredibly low toxicity threshold. Uh, you could, you know, the, the gas uh, ratio for that is, is ridiculous. So, I mean, you could stay at the high end forever uh, with no harm, except you're being a little wasteful. So you probably don't need to do that. But I definitely think probably damn near everyone in the Western world is chromium deficient and anyone pushing the high side of carbohydrates is probably deficient. And I guarantee you, if you're using metformin and or insulin, you're deficient. So definitely suggest you use some chromium and there's some numbers for you. Just uh, kind of thought that would be helpful. It's uh, completely random, I admit, but there you are. Uh, another, another great um, kind of concept that came through. Uh, this wasn't really posted as a question per se, but it was, uh, again, I didn't record their entire name, but someone named Soren that I was t communicating with asked a question about SHBG. And I apologize for this because a lot of times I just start, you know, rambling on. Um, not necessarily quantifying that not everybody knows what I know. So I just start rambling on about how SHBG, you know, captures free sex hormones and, you know, on and on and on. And I fail to mention what to me is very obvious, but I apologize if I didn't make it obvious to everyone else. And the question is, what then happens to it? Okay, these sex hormones bind to SHBG, and then where does the story go for there? And the where the story goes from there is SHBG is basically just a large protein these sex hormones bind to it. Now they're tangled up and momentarily inactive because they are bound to this large protein. And then over time, at the natural decay rate of proteins, something called the protein turnover rate, those proteins, the SHBG, decays, re-releasing that sex hormone into circulating, uh, you know, the potentially utilizable back into circulation. So what SHBG and all binding proteins are essentially is a time release mechanism. So, and the reason that's so relevant is because of another concept that maybe I don't make sufficiently clear when I talk about these things is hormone production is an all or nothing concept. 
you, there's no dial on your thyroid, your pituitary, your you know, testicular axis. They either manufacture at full speed or they don't. And so what happens is, you know, your body wants a homeostasic level of whatever you're talking about, but production is very 100%, no percent, 100%, no percent. To, and the average, of course, is this homeostasic line that you're, you know, seeking. So what happens is the, the concept, the uh, existence of binding proteins helps moderate the peaks and valleys because during that peak, a bunch of that or a portion of that, I guess a bunch is bad language, but a portion of that hormone gets tied up in binding globulins and then gets dribbled out later, assuming or, or expectantly during some of the troughs. So that little dribbling from the release at protein turnover rate decay of binding globulin fills in some of the troughs. So even though production is very, very jagged, your actual ambient hormone levels are a bit more moderated by binding globulins. So again, just, just to kind of randomly fill in some knowledge gaps that I, I probably am guilty of leaving for you uh, is that um, SHBG and all binding proteins do not, you know, destroy or gobble up or consume uh, whatever hormone they're associated with. They simply delay its action. They steal it away, hold it in stasis, if you will, for a period of time. Protein turnover rate is typically 7 to 14 days, depending specifically on the protein and the, the, the tax and dynamics of the system. But if, if you assume 7 to 14 days, you're pretty close. So anything that's tied to the binding globulin is basically just out of action for one to two weeks, and then it comes back into play. So anyway, there's another just random thing that has cropped up. Excuse me for one moment. Mm. Coffee is so such a wonderful thing. Um, uh, someone named Zane was asking me about primobolin. He was aware of my kind of quasi love affair with primobolin and uh, wh whether or not there was any kind of tips or tricks to identify whether the product you have is real. Um, the answer to that is actually no. Other than experience, you know, actually knowing the source, that sort of thing. And the problem with the reason for that is this. Um, Primobolin and Mastron are shockingly similar. And I do love Primobolin. I do prefer it over Mastron. However, I will be completely fair, and I try to be, and I think I've said this in the past, Mastron is 80% everything Primobolin is. They're that similar. You know, Pr Primobolin is maybe 20% better but it's only that. So if you had them side by side and didn't have a deep level of experience, 200 milligram pre 200 milligram Mastron, you probably would not know the difference. Uh, so there's that. Secondly, you can buy testing kits. There's a Roid test, a couple of others, basic home chemistry set that will allow you to determine to some degree what's in the bottle. What that will be able to do is just differentiate the family. It will differentiate between a testosterone-based androgen a 19 nor androgen or a DHT androgen. So again, it will tell you if it's an active steroid and it will tell you of what family. Unfortunately, Mastron and Primobolin are both of the same family and first cousins. So it wouldn't be able to, again, differentiate between them. So the actual answer to the question is no, there really isn't a way to know other than you know having a high degree of faith in the product you're buying and the people who are putting out the product you're buying or just balls out sending it for gas chromatography, which is a bit expensive unless you have very, very specific needs. Uh, and that does happen. You know, athletes that are being drug tested, also, there's all sorts of reasons why that might happen. But just for, you know, Joe average, you know, you know, once a six pack, probably not going to go to that level. My suggestion would be just, you know, kind of trust your source, know your source, do the best you can. But even if you're getting scammed and you're getting, you know, Master Anthate, you're still getting 80% of the, you know, what you're paying for, and it's it's going to be pretty good. Um, you know, I hate to suggest you, you know, don't get what you're paying for, but you're getting close. So, I, eh, I'm sure you don't love that answer, but it's what I got. Uh, ah, the last thing before I, uh, I haven't even looked at what's coming through on the ticker, and I apologize, people. Uh, the last thing I wanted to tackle, and I'm going to kind of skirt it a little bit, but I do want to respond to it because it was a, a, such a great question. And I think I'm going to do some sort of a video or blog post or something 
on this separately. But uh, I really can't pronounce the poor guy's last name. But uh, his first name was Bach, and probably not even pronounced that way. Uh, Asian languages just destroy me. I have not the ability to do the... No, now I won't even try because it's embarrassing. But Bach, if you're listening, you know who you are, and you'll recognize your question. And his question was, you know, I'm I'm a young person. I'm interested in the field. I'm studying at university. What else do I need to do to get where you are? Be who you are and doing what you're doing. You know, ten, fifteen years in the future. And um, it is a fucking amazing question, and it's actually one that I cannot answer because. And, and bear with me because I know it sounds bizarre. I didn't have a fucking plan. My plan all along was just survive and fucking enjoy what I was doing. I didn't have a plan in terms of a business plan. I had a, an athletic plan. I had a plan in regards to, you know, I want to go and train with that guy. I want to do that. I need to know what that fucking guy is doing. But it wasn't in the concept of, ooh, and then I'm going to run off and make it a business. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the whole make it a business time came, I struggled immensely. I was very bad at it. I don't have a gift for business. Uh, it was a problem. You know, my plan A, B, and C were all just uh, keep trying. Like that was literally what I had. So this idea of, you know, what should I do is really, really hard for me to answer because, you know, my, my success, if you will, and truthfully, my success is probably very limited, uh, you know, not to be an ass, but my skill set probably you know, reflects a much greater, you know, income and success than I have. So I'm really not capable of doing that, but I will tell you this, reflecting on it, and, and this is something I'm going to talk about, you know, whenever I do really talk about that or talk about this topic is um, the university side of it was valuable, but honestly, it was the, in today, when I work on a day-to-day -day level, it is by far the least relevant of the skills I've accrued. Education is enormously important, but personal experience, personal observation, and just simple interaction, interviewing people. And, and I, when I say interviewing people, just when I have a conversation with X, Y, or Z person, in my mind, that's an interview. Um, I'm sure they don't think of it that way. And I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate the thinking that way, but I'm cataloging shit. And, just cataloging experience and having that just reservoir of I've seen that before. I've heard about that before. So-and-so did that before. So-and-so suggested that before. Having that reservoir of just sheer information is the biggest part of what I do today. A lot of times people, you know, they're, they're like, oh, my God, you're so clever. You noticed that, you know, my low calcium would come up if I had, you know, a ate more salt. And it's, it's just one of those things where there was a study 30 years ago. I read it, I recognized it. And then I cataloged that against, you know, a hundred or more pieces of blood work. And it just, it's one of those things where it's body of experience and knowledge is much more important than specific knowledge. I, I really, really believe that. So um, I, I will put this on a shelf and come back to it and try and do some sort of a bit more organized, but I just wanted to say, cause you kind of referenced, you know, the university thing. And I'm sure you're really proud of that. And I'm sure I'm really proud of that. That's good. Uh, I'm proud of the degree I have, but I want to be fair and say, I do this, you know, 50 hours a week sitting in front of the keyboard. My university, you know, aspect is that what I use the least. I just want to just want to tell you that now, you know, you might be a different person. You might have a different mindset. You might have a lot of differences. So I'm not telling you like, oh, quit school and just go, you know, fucking sit a gym. Not, not at all what I mean. But what I'm saying is today for me, if I had to catalog the relevance of the things that I've done and the places I've been, it's much more about cataloging experience and observation than it is about the ability to, you know, read and write studies and, things of that nature uh, that has value for sure. But it's also, you know, and to, to quote, uh, you know, Frank Zappa, you know, if, if you want an education, go to the library, you know, if you want to get laid, go to university. So there, there's that too, you know, there's, you know, education's an ethereal thing. It's just, you, you want to fucking learn stuff, you go find it. So anyway, having said all that, let's look at some of the things that have come in the, uh, 
Oh, very fucking cool. Somebody from India. I don't know if any one of my watchers has ever announced that they're from India. Uh, there's a fucking billion plus people there, and I think you're the first one to tune into me. So fuck, fuck yeah, that's very cool. Uh, Eurus has signed on. I spoke to him just a few minutes ago. By the way, my friend, just let me say here, you're fucking looking amazing. You're dialing in incredibly quick. And uh, those little chicken necks in England are not going to have the slightest idea what's going on when you get up on stage with that kind of density. You're going to fucking scare those little pale people. So anyway, <laughs> I probably shouldn't be so mean. England's a huge part of my income, but yeah, fuck them. Uh... Brevin, in terms of loss of insulin sensitivity with insulin use, uh, more total dose. Um, you have stepped into the mud there in a way that's really hard. You, which scenario dumbs down insulin sensitivity the most? is a hugely debated topic. Is it absolute dose? Is it dose duration? Is it some combination thereof? Um, I don't even know if I know the answer to that, but I know this, and it's relevant to your question. Regardless of what impacts insulin sensitivity the most, and I suspect it's absolute dosage more than duration, I suspect. But the reality is, don't think about it that way. Think about what's going to give you the most effect per dosing, and that is longer, lower, slower. Greater exposure over a greater period of time is always the route, in my opinion, always the route to greater long-term success. So even if that's you know more deleterious in the long term to your insulin sensitivity, it's more efficacious to the goal you're seeking. So that is the way I would do that. And then keep in mind that insulin sensitivity, yes, plasma insulin levels are definitely going to impact that, but so are countermeasures like a high degree of fitness, a high degree of lean mass, use of metformin, use of you know, chromium picolinate, all of those things. So I don't think I would worry about which is more deleterious specifically in my dosing pattern. I would dose according to my goal and do everything I can to counterbalance to mitigate the, the, ne the negatives and then just run with it. If it becomes a problem, just simply truncate your total use duration. That is how I would handle it, and that is how I you know, program that for myself and athletes that I work with. So uh, Sometimes you can beat your head on a wall just worrying about one little aspect. You're like, oh, how do I dodge that? And you wind up just fucking wrecking everything, trying to avoid this one little thing that wasn't that big of a thing in the first place. Uh, so, you know, And I'm not trying to say that insulin sensitivity isn't a big thing. It, it, re it really is, but if you go out of your way to you know, just maintain perfect insulin sensitivity, you're just going to live in a fucking bubble and do nothing. And you're going to be in a little, you know, oxygen tent, you know, doing nothing. So, uh, you know, at some point you have to, you know, own up and do something. Uh, Joe Jeffrey, in your experience, guys suffering GI issues from orals bypass that with injectable orals. Um, the actual answer to that is yes. Yeah, um, I've actually seen really good results with, uh, you know, making uh, injectable, especially Dianabol. But um, my suggestion would be just why? Just wh wh why? Orals have value, especially coming into a contest. Uh, now, I'm assuming you're not talking about like a drug-tested athlete or, you know, some of the niche things. But you're just talking bodybuilding, powerlifting. Orals are not vital. They're not necessary. Just if they're a problem, fucking shelve them. Move on. Use more high-quality injectable, long, you know, long-acting anabolics. Why walk around trying to fight stomach issues and you know, and then you then you're not getting enough calories and it just why even if there was some benefit that you know was just so good, is it really so good in comparing to shit your brains out and or not being able to eat or both? It's, eh. My suggestion would be just stop racking your head, stop being, you know, stop making it a problem and just shelve the shit, move on to something you know is going to work, and that's how I would do that. But to answer the question you asked, yes. Um, for instance, I don't even know if it exists anymore, but there was an incredible product. Uh, it was called Reforvit B. It was a Mexican 
uh, veterinary product. Came in 50 and 100 mil bottles. It was uh, Dianabol, methanin, stendrolone, uh, and B vitamins intended for uh, cattle, swine, etc. cetera. Uh, and I, I believe it was 25 milligrams per mil. Uh, and it worked like a charm and did not cause any you know, digestive issues. Of course it was IM, but I mean, it just, it it did not, it skirted that a hundred percent. It was a great, great product. So the answer to your question is yes. Uh, Even to some degree, and I don't understand this, a good friend of mine has real stomach problems. Like real, uh, brought on by a wound. He was stabbed and uh, he's got like, you know, he had like portion of his bowel removed. He's, he's a fucking mess. But anyway, moral of the story is one tablet. He's just blown up. However, if he takes, those tablets crushes them, dissolves them, and suspends them in something like uh, like milk of magnesia, some sort of viscous, you know, liquid. Um, he can then take them and, and survive it pretty well. Don't even understand that per se, but for what it's worth. Again, going back to that other conversation about just worldly experience is fucking enormously valuable. I guarantee you there's not a professor in the world that's going to propose that just because why would they? You have to have been there and seen it. So for, for what that's worth, that's kind of an example of my example. Uh, David Herrera, you have fucking landed right on the, right on the point. Uh, Clombuterol is an anti-catabolic slash anabolic. Do I find it more effective for women? The absolute fucking answer is yes, and I do not know why. I have looked at study after study. I have looked for that answer. Do not know why, but the absolute answer is yes. It is more effective both for fat loss and anabolism in women than men. It's very effective in men. Don't get me wrong, but it is more effective in women. I do not know why. It could be as simple as women are smaller, yet equally tolerant so you actually get a little bit more dosage per body weight kind of ratio it could be nothing more than that to get a commensurate you know dosage you know you got a a, a 60 kilogram woman that's able to take you know 80 micrograms 100 micrograms which is a whopping dose but they can do it to get that same you know dosing ratio in a man you know you're talking like two 300 micrograms and that's almost intolerable so it may just be you know, scaling, a scale issue. But I don't know, but the answer is absolutely yes. And uh, clombuterol is absolutely, you know, a a staple among, you know, figure physique, you know, women. uh, And and it it should be. It's a great drug and very, very little to no, you know, masculinizing effects. Uh, Maybe not the best thing in the universe for the heart, but I doubt these people are really scale, you know, factoring that into their equation. Jonas, is there benefit to maintenance phase after a bulking improvement season before cutting? Um, Benefit. You can design programming so that anything has a benefit anywhere. If that is your purpose, if you set out with that goal, you absolutely can. For instance, my good friend, Dr. Mike Isretel would absolutely say, yes, it's a staple. You have to do that. And under the context, the guys and the framework, which he's doing things, he is correct. He is not lying. He is everything that yes. However, in the world I live in where things are accelerated by pharmacology and things are mediated and modulated by pharmacology and specific strategies, it is by no means necessary. Is it probably still a good idea? Yes, because I consider things outside of just the training structure, the drug structure, and even to some degree the goal structure. Things like humans, we have a life, we have a job, we have girlfriends, we have a you know, refrigerators, we have bills, we have things. So it's very often beneficial to build a window of what I call preparatory time, where this time we're going to design training, pharmacology, and what have you coming. We're going to fill the refrigerator appropriately. We're going to make sure the proper training partners, training equipment is available. We're going to make sure that, you know, finances are appropriate to all of that. We're going to make sure all the necessary pharmacology is sourced and et cetera. So, yeah, you could call it a, you know, if you're a natural guy, that's a maintenance cycle. But if it's 
not a natural person. In my mind, that's a different language, and it's a preparatory phase where we're just getting all our ducks in a row. We're kind of training in limbo because we're not doing anything special with nutrition. We're not doing anything special with pharmacology, et cetera, but we're doing something really special behind the scenes, which is fucking planning so that when we come out of the blocks, it's like a fucking race car. So I don't know if that's exactly what you were sh shooting for there, but that's how I would answer that. You know, the, yeah, the answer is yes. If you If you – Design your thing in such a way that that's necessary, then well, it's fucking necessary. Can you design it so that it's not necessary? Absolutely. I do think that is one of the problems, and I don't like to speak to the natural world because I'm not part of it. I don't do it. I don't even like them. You know. However, I do think just from a, from a distance looking in, I do think one of the problems naturals have is they, to some degree, over-fucking plan, and they're so resigned to making such little progress that they have a lot of blank spots. I, I really do believe that. Um, I, and, and believe me, it's easy for me to say that out here because, you know, to me it's just two extra milligrams and I'm making progress. You know, I, I'm not in the, their shoes, so maybe it's completely inappropriate for me to say anything. Kyle Spencer says, hi, Sh sir. How the fuck are you? Uh, let's see. As far as home brewing goes – can DECA hold at 400 milligrams per milliliter? Yes, it can. Uh, DECA can go about 400. Boldenone can go up about five. Uh, they have a particularly low melting point and therefore uh, dissolve easily and hold in solution easy, easily with relatively little, uh, you know, benzoyl, benzoate or what have you. Uh, uh, will heating it be dangerous? Heating it. Uh, obscenely above the melting point, yes, you can break down anything. You, you know, fucking heat anything. You, you know, you can melt lead. You can do whatever you want. But um, for the most part, you know, any degradation is in the, you know, single digit percentile range and completely workable within you, the equation of what you're doing. Um, again, you have to heat it sufficiently to get it to properly disperse, make uh, some of the molecular bonds accessible and what have you. So, I wouldn't worry about that, but the answer is yes, you can damage it, but don't be an asshole. You're not fucking boiling it like soup. You're just trying to get it to the proper temperature to, you know, generate the necessary affinities and what have you. So um, the answer is yes, but the concern is no, no not really. A uh, question in regards to IGF-1 that actually started in, a, in a Instagram, which I'll actually have to make a note to come back to as a point of topic. But um, the question is, uh, using IGF-1 because of the very short F-life uh, at a specific time, the answer is yes. Um, IGF-1 receptors only upregulate under certain conditions. Those conditions are the exposure by previously by somatropic hormone, uh, growth hormone, and or exercise, and the timing is very specific. It is actually one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of using IGF-1 for its specific or, no, or for its nonspecific anabolic processes. Uh, I do like it for injury treatment and what have you. Uh, I used it you know, when, when I was damaged both by feet and by pec. Um, but as a day-to-day -day anabolic, it, it has enormous potential, but it is so fucking complicated and timing-specific that I would avoid it. But to answer your question, yes. Um, about 90 minutes post-workout is the period of time when you have the highest uh, amount of IGF-1 slash binding protein affinity, and that would be the time that's most uh, advantageous to get the exposure. Uh, also, you could do that in the 90-minute post somatropic hormone environment apply apply growth hormone and about 90 maybe 120 minutes later the whole growth hormone cycle has completed ending with and then igf1 comes in so um you know something that was experimented pretty hard with in the in the early 2000s was the idea of you know applying growth hormone exercise or not applying growth hormone and then 90 to 120 minutes later additionally supplementally exposing igf1 uh, at the time, they were using 
LR3 and it wasn't working very well, I suspect that scenario might work a lot better with some of the new, you know, other products, the DES and et cetera. But um, that, that's how that would work. Yes, you're right. The, the, up, the, the uh, you know, peptide upregulation, reception, and execution is a very narrow window and therefore very time sensitive. It's one of the reasons why it's not particularly well used outside of high-level athletics is because it's just fucking tough. There's my wife. Let's see here. <laughs> Kyle Spencer, I, I was just fucking with the English, called them pale, and he's, he's telling me that, that uh, some of them are uh, as tanned as, as Casper right now. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure you little narrow pale people are. Just as dark as be all. Um, although I do understand you have an immigration problem, so maybe the national average is shifting. It could be that. I don't know. Is that too? I don't mean to be racist. I just, you know, people from other lands seem to be a bit darker. So if they're immigrating there, maybe your, you know, your national average is skewing. You'll catch up to the rest of us. Uh, any, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, oh, awesome question. Probably the least. Uh, politically correct topic. David Herrera is asking about DNP. Um, is there a milligram per kilogram dosage that you would start with? Well, first of all, I would never recommend you do DNP. I have done it. A number of my athletes have done it, but I'm not going to recommend you do it. Where are you going to do it? My suggestion would be start at right around two milligrams per kilogram. Uh, that is low and is still effective. It will give you a taste and a feel of what's going on. The upside is you can go to and, and I, you know, I know there's like internet videos, like people, oh, use a gram of DNP. Don't fucking do that. The maximum I would suggest uh, anyone even consider is about six milligrams per kilogram. And by the way, that is actually why DNP is illegal. It's not that it doesn't work. It's not even that it, you know, the process is so scary or whatever. It's um, the effective dosage and the uh, fatal dosage are too close together. Lots and lots of medications are discovered and discarded for that very reason. Um, you know, you know, you know, somebody swallows their pills. An hour later, they forget that they swallowed their pills. They're like, oh, did I tell? I'll take it again. They take it again. They're fucking dead. That is unacceptable. Uh, so there is a you know margin of buffer built into the safety efficacy of drugs. DNP does not meet that. Literally. 25% additional dosage can push you into the fatal zone. Therefore, it is not legal uh, and not workable and you know not really appropriate for the public. Um, so just know that. But as little as two milligrams per kilogram will give you more than enough effect to gauge where you need to move forward. I would say two milligrams per kilogram is not going to kill you. Uh, and it's also enough that it's going to give you a strong idea of what that drug is all about. So that's where I would start. Uh, and, and quite honestly, to point of fact, that is where I start. When I'm going to use DMP, I actually start at two milligrams per kilogram for a couple of days, scoot it up a little bit, and then back down a little bit, and then up and down. You know. So I kind of wave between two and 300 milligrams, quite literally. Uh, my body weight's a little heavier now, so maybe I'd go a little higher. But in general, that's the answer. <sighs> Uh, I saw this question somewhere else came through as an email or maybe a Facebook, um, talking about estrogen. Um, actually the wording of the question is a little shaky. Uh, we know that more tea equals more aromatase. Um, yes, but the greatest, uh, modulator of total volume of aromatase and therefore total conversion of testosterone to estrogen is actually your leanness. Uh, aromatase is manufactured in adipose tissue. The fatter you are, the greater reservoir of aromatase you have. Yes, your body will upregulate production of aromatase in, in response to elevating androgen levels, but to a much lower degree than it will to escalating body fat. So though that is a factor, the bigger factor is just how fucking fat you are. And secondly, um, your overall fitness has a strong influence on aromatase production. Uh, there's a lot of complicated enzyme processes that go on there that are controlled by mitochondrial up and down regulation. So you're right in that response, but you're right uh, 
you're, you're wrong in prioritizing it at the top. The biggest issue is not your total volume of estrogen of testosterone it's actually your total volume of body fat then secondarily perhaps is your total testosterone level um okay so then from there the question is kind of um is it a ratio issue of you know testosterone to estrogen or is it an absolute estrogen value it is definitely an absolute estrogen value it cannot be ratio if it was ratio you would just be able to scale everything up and at nine grams of testosterone you're still no risk of you know gynecomastia because you're in proper you know ratio it does not work that way the ratio part does come into play in terms of total health your influence on you know blood lipid profile inflammation markers that ratio thing is a real biological concept that has real impacts on your overall health and survivability yes but the gynecomastia feminizing effects typically come on at a threshold number now here's the real problem with that estrogen in general in a big in a global concept is absolutely positive right up until the moment when it becomes negative. So this idea of what's, what, what should my estrogen be? I can give you a ballpark zone, but the reality is the more you can have without generating, without manifesting side effects, the better your health will be. Keyword, I didn't say performance. I didn't say anabolism. I didn't say a lot of things. I said health. In general, the higher your estrogen value can be, the better your longevity, the better your health, specifically your cardiac health and joint health. So there's that. However, from a kind of workable number scenario, uh, in a, U- in a U.S. based blood test, you're typically looking for uh, estrogen between 40 and 60. I have found consistently that the sweet spot seems to be right around a hundred. However, what I'll do is I'll bring an athlete to a hundred if they're not already there. And most of the time they are because of overuse of, you know, testosterone, dianabol, et cetera. And then I'll mess around with let, let's, let's bring it up to 150 and see what goes on. Let's personally, I float between hundred and 200, 200. I'm starting to get a little squirrely. I'm puffy in the face. I'm a little, not as good as I could be. And at a hundred, I'm fucking romping on my wife to the point where she wants me to settle the fuck down. So it's, it's, there's that zone, but in general, that is the zone. But yes, the ratio thing is real, but the ratio thing is more relevant to health and longevity, probably more relevant to like TRT people than athletes that are driving their, you know, androgen values up to, you know, 900% baseline. But um, I probably should put together some material specifically just on estrogen manipulation, management, and control because it seems to be something that we just keep coming back to. But um, the key thing I think for this question, the key takeaway you should take is the biggest influencer on volume of aromatase and therefore potential conversion from testosterone to estrogen is actually fatness. Um, You really want to keep your body fat below 15%. Leaner is better again, until it isn't. So somewhere between 10 and 15 is probably your zone. Uh, Depending on body type and what have you, I would say, you know, one side or the other, but that's the general gist of it. And then also consider this too, is potentially different anabolics have different impacts. Um, Mastrona primobolin and to smaller degree, uh, stenozolol, they themselves have a slight anti-aromatase effect. So a given estrogen value, in the absence of those is one thing, but then in the presence of, you'll see that value come down. So just implementing, you know, master enanthate into a cycle can bring your uh, circulating estrogen down 10, 15%. So there's a lot of variables. There's a lot of moving parts here, but in general, there's some thoughts you can, you know, put into that. Uh... Brevin, what are my thoughts on the studies done on myostatin interfering with muscle growth and even halting most gains after six to eight week mark? Um, Yeah, you know what the problem with those studies is? They were all done on fucking naturals. Uh, Anabolic steroids interfere with myostatin production and and, uh, execution, so I think it's completely irrelevant. Uh, I don't think that a six to eight week cycle in in regards to pharmacology is even remotely sufficient. My experience tells me that it's not, and um, yeah, I just think short cycles are stupid. And again, uh, not not to be overly, you know, 
critical and condescending, but you know, if you're a fucking natural and you're growing at the fucking speed of smell, maybe that's relevant. I don't know. Cause I don't do that. Um, you know, go ask, you know, Steve Hall or, you know, Lyle McDonald or somebody who focuses on that. They might have some insight. I don't cause it's just not where my thinking is. It's not even something I want to think about. I don't care about how slow you can possibly grow. Like I just don't give a fuck. I'm sorry if that offends you, but um, you're, you're watching the wrong shit if it does, because I'm, I'm not that guy. So, anyway. Um, Michael Wegzer, what a fucking cool question. It's stu- it's, I say it's stupid. I'm not, I'm not being a dick. I was just being a dick. I apologize. It's just one of those stupid little questions that I would never think to respond to until you blurted it out. Um, does creatine requirements change on anabolic steroids? The absolute answer is yes. Um, the reason why creatine monohydrate works Okay. The reason why it is valid and has such strong efficacy is because it mimics one of the actions of anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids, testosterone, and especially the subderivatives have a strong upregulatory influence on the creatine synthase enzyme, therefore causing your cells, your muscle cells, to manufacture more creatine. So while you're on steroids, you're on creatine. So guess what? While you're on steroids, you actually don't really need creatine monohydrate. You don't need additional creatine because your cells are manufacturing it. However, it would be a wonderful thing to introduce to counterbalance the diminishment when you come off of steroids. So it's definitely a wonderful bridge product and something that I strongly recommend use myself and would have all of my clients use. But while you're on steroids, it really has almost no additional you know, uh, complementary benefit because your cells are already doing that. But very cool that you asked that question. And um, that's a problem I have is I think on, you know, the level that I think on and do the shit I do. And sometimes I forget to come back to these very simple and basic concepts. And I I know that sometimes what comes out of my mouth sounds very condescending. I I don't mean it that way. And I appreciate those sorts of questions because it brings me back to the fucking ground and lets me remember the audience in which I'm speaking to, Um, you know, my, my, you know, secret life when I'm not doing this, you know, I'm on the phone with you know, Mike Isretel and Lyle McDonald and PhD, this guy, and, you know, farm D that guy. And I, I think and operate on a level where I just have assumptions that the person I'm talking to knows the shit I'm talking about. And oftentimes it's a situation where they know much more than I'm talking about. So sometimes when I'm talking to them, to, you know, other people in gen pop and what have you, I, I forget that. And I, it's, it's bad of me and I apologize. And I appreciate questions like that bringing me back. So I, I know sometimes what I say sounds a bit dickish, but it's just cause I'm a dick. It's not cause I'm attacking you. I, it's not at all what I mean. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, is there a role for base test trend, et cetera? Uh, for hypertrophy. For hypertrophy, really no. Uh, There is a place for that sort of stuff in treating specific moments, conditions, pre-contest, that that sort of thing, dodging drug tests. They have value, but as a long-term, again, my attitude on these things, if it hasn't come through, let me just state it as plainly as I can. Longer, lower, slower is better. Uh, Non-esterified products don't meet that requirement in any, any way. Um, you know, if you have to inject something every day or even twice a day, that's not longer, lower, slower, avoid it. Um, again, not to say that it doesn't have a place. It does, but it's not in a, you know, day-to-day hypertrophy type scenario. Uh, for a female, would taking 10 milligrams of anadrol paired with the appropriate DNP dosage be great for recomposition? Yes, it fucking would. And that is very shockingly similar to some of the guru-esque uh, things going on in the fitness figure world right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's pretty much your starting point plus clombuterol plus thyroid plus, plus, plus. But that's pretty much your starting point for an awful lot of Olympia caliber uh, figure fitness type chicks, uh, no doubt. Uh, probably also cropping up in CrossFit. I don't want to say too much about that because they're already pissed at me, but uh, yeah. yeah. Fuck them. Uh, can I please say something about awful lipolic acid? Um, yeah, I can. Um, effective? 
but effective in the context of it's OTC. It's, you know, 0.5% effective. It's, you know, are you going to get a drug-like effect? Absolutely not. Uh, are you going to get a very nominal effect that over time can accrue to be something? Yes. Um, do I spend my money on it? No. Um, people that have a little bit tendency toward, you know, uh, body fat issues. I don't want to say obesity because we're, you know, theoretically talking about athletes and what have you. But if in the, the scale of concerns, leanness is one of your greater issues. Yes, I've found that uh, alpha lipoic acid has some strong impact. Interesting, one of the best little bits I ever read on uh, um, ALA is, um, oh, what's his name? The four-hour guy, four-hour diet. Um, he actually had a, a, a little bit on that where he was you know doing his grand diet thing and and um really what what he wrote was actually su surprisingly poignant and, and correct and, and accurate and so yeah if you just have money to spend and you want a product that has some validity yeah um in the big picture you know in the world we live in comparable to drugs and what have you it's fucking meaningless but you know it, it, it is a thing yes Uh, Francisco Martinez is asking me possible causes for high estrogen levels with symptoms with normal testosterone levels. Well, you got to, first of all, quantify normal. Normal is not actually normal. There is, you know, the medically considered reference range of, you know, 300 to 900 nanograms per deciliter. However, that's bell curve normal. Some people just come out of the womb with a natural testosterone of 200. So if that guy's at 600, that's not actually normal even though 600 is within the medically accepted normal. And then the other side of the coin is there are some people that just come out of the womb with, you know, a thousand nanograms per deciliter. You know, if they're at 500, that's not normal, even though 500 falls within the medically accepted normal. So there's that. Then secondarily, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, total body fat is one of the biggest influencers of conversion to estrogen. So there's that. Then second or maybe not second, but down this tier, there's also the impact of the rest of the HPTA axis. Your circulating thyroid values have an influence on testosterone to estrogen conversion. Uh, inflammation markers have an impact, not a strong one, but they do, uh, as does prolactin, progestin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's all interwebbed and intertwined, but the biggest influencer is where is your testosterone relevant to where it genetically ought to be? What is your body fat? And lastly, what is your activity? A lot of times you find people with skewed testosterone estrogen values. Now, I have no idea if this is the case with you, but a lot of times you find they're simply inactive. And if they engage in activity, you see a correction of those values from nothing other than implementing, you know, in some cases, as little as walks, uh, you know, just to get exercise. So, it, it's a, a broad sweeping thing. Uh, also that can influence that is a, a sex hormone binding globulin, which can be brought on by you know, hyperinsulinemia and some other conditions. So there's a lot to it. I would look at blood work, uh, not just extensive blood work, but ideally historic blood work. A lot of times if you lay out blood work you know, over a course of a couple of years, you can recognize where things went wrong, go back on the calendar and figure out what was going on, and you can find the trigger point for a thing. A lot of this, you know, we experts and what have you are so smart and know so much shit, but a lot of times it's nothing but basic detective work where you just track it down. You're like, all right, here's where the crime was committed. And then you start put filling in the pieces like a detective novel. And lo and behold, you could kind of be, you could illustrate what happened where it's not so much as actually diagnosed. You know, it's not sometimes where I'm just so clever. I go, Oh, on January 4th, you had a, you know, granuloma and your, you know, thyroid gland or, you know, sometimes it's that we can find that this is where the blood work went askew. Now what fuck happened then that sort of thing. So there's a lot to it, but um, I don't know if I just helped you or not, but some thought, some thoughts on that. Andre Pappas has joined, sir. How the hell are you? We need to catch up. At the worst, you need to be on the fucking phone Wednesday uh, at our normal time. If not, if, if there's time before then, let me know and we'll try and do something extra. Uh, can I explain why DECA makes joints feel better? In actual fact, no. 
Can I give you some suspicions? Yes. Um, probably my biggest suspicion is just sheer water retention. Nandrolone 19 nor derivatives cause water retention. Water retention tends to manifest in the joint compartments, making a bit more hydrostatic pressure, making the joints more padded. I think that's probably the biggest one. Secondarily, contrary to the fucking trend lovers of the universe, uh, they're Typical attitude is 19 or derivatives do in fact have progestanic effects. They have some influence on the progestin receptor. There's probably some inflammatory up and down regulation going on because of that. It's super complicated. I've never taken the time to follow it out through all its many you know, permutations, but I suspect it's going on. I don't know how big of an impact it is, but I do suspect it's going on. And I do suspect that probably has some influence on joint health but in my opinion the biggest influence is just sheer cellular water retention and interbursal cellular water retention uh which is not to be scoffed at deca does make your joints feel better the more you take the better they feel also the bigger your fucking face looks so you know you want to look like a pregnant samoan with healthy joints i just completely racist i'm not picking on samoans but they tend to have full faces fuck <laughs> take any name any other group of people that has big round pie faces and you know use them so we're not picking on Samoans because they're nice people. I know a couple that are fucking cool. So anyway. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so shit with dealing with people. I'm so bad at it. Like you should never listen to me because I, I just I fucking just just go from group to group and insult and <laughs> degradate. And I don't mean to. Not really. Uh Ah, uh, in reference to that estrogen question, assuming the person is lean and in good shape. Um, there are potential problems there, and one of them can simply be, uh, and, and you don't want to hear this, but one of them can just be shit luck. You can just be a person that has particularly high estrogen sensitivity at the breast tissue or you know any other tissue for that matter. Uh, it could just be shit luck. Um, there are people out there, you know, that don't use drugs, don't have any lifestyle issues, don't anything, and still wind up with gynecomastia. It's a condition that existed long before, you know, in a box steroids. So it, it could be as corny and unhelpful as, and you're just shit lucky. You're just not that guy. Um, but I would strongly suggest you get some blood work and look at the width and birth of it. Look at your, you know, progestin, prolactin, values look at you know thyroid values because it is very conceivable that one of them is askew and causing the domino downstream effect giving you some problems so that that's where i would start but it could just be as simple as and you've got shit luck Uh, Brevet is asking me about something I said in the past about, you know, about a 10% escalation in anabolic dose. And is that in reference to my attitude that longer, lower, slower is better? The answer is absolutely yes. And to build on that and elaborate on that, also keep in mind, biologist, study biology. I looked at, you know, I have been exposed to, looked at, and worked with growth rates of creatures across the animal kingdom across lifespans, you know, in terms of the individual creatures and growth can only take place at a given rate. And I think that that rate, even though it's super physiological, you know, based on drug use, based on training, et cetera, that 10% escalation over a longer, greater time is more sustainable, more achievable, uh, less likely to train wreck injuries, et cetera. I just think that that is your best option for long-term career-based growth. Can you force greater growth at greater dosages and faster escalations? Absolutely. Is it sustainable? Absolutely not. So it, it's a little bit of a philosophy thing, um, you know, and, and, and I'm cool with that. If you choose to do otherwise, I'm fine with that. I just feel compelled to give you my experience, my attitude, my et cetera. Uh, but yeah, you can, you know, at the end of the day, it's your life and your drugs you can take whatever the fuck you want i don't care um and and i'm even cool like like report in and tell me how it's going like i'll i'll you know i'll uh you know i'll, I'll pen your soliloquy <laughs> give a fuck. so anyway uh, jonas Schwartz, have you run into any sleep issues i won't even read the rest of the question dude i'm a walking sleep issue i haven't slept like the rest of you 
in my entire life. So anyway, what does it say? Uh, oh, and sleep apnea and what have you. Um, I am actually at an all-time heavy. I am about 110 kilos. I was literally about 240, 242 right now at five foot four. Um, I am right on the cusp of having sleep apnea. Uh, what little sleep I do is a little, a little, you know, problematic. Uh, if I get any heavier, and I kind of don't think I will, just because I'm fucking 47, and I don't need to be this goddamn big. Although it's fucking fun. Um, but I suspect this is right where it would come into play. Uh, when I was younger and this heavy and almost this heavy, I had no issue, but again, I was younger, you know, number of differences, but, uh, yeah, it, it definitely comes on you at some point. It's, it's essentially unavoidable. Uh, Rick Romano, uh, asking about, uh, Andre Pappas. Yeah. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> do I coach him? Uh, <clears throat> well, as you said, Andre's a really smart guy. He does not need coaching. He and I have a bit of a collaborative, you know, environment. It's always nice to have somebody, you know, equally versed, equally experienced to kind of just weigh in, check on you you know, interject some outside perspective. And that's what he and I do for one another. I would not by any stretch, you know, like Mike Isretel. I don't coach Mike Isretel. Uh, I offer outside perspective and a different set of experiences so that he can make better decisions. Same thing here. You know, Andre's fucking wicked smart. He does not need me to tell him how to eat or lift weights. He knows that shit. Uh, but I do, you know, consult with him, speak with him, interject, offer some thoughts and ideas, and he does the same for me. So uh, that that's uh, something that I suggest everyone out there try and find someone that can do that for you because it's it's valuable. More valuable probably than you realize if you don't have somebody doing it. Once you get somebody like that, you realize, holy shit, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. So um, Michael Wegzer, can I explain how Masteron mediates estrogen levels? The answer to that is in precision, no, because uh, to my knowledge, no one actually knows. Although you can go back and look at um, something I strongly recommend everybody does is go to a book sale, go to a library, go to wherever they're selling old books and buy yourself a PDR, a physician's desk reference from the 60s or 70s, you know, out of date, because you'll find all sorts of interesting nuggets. And one of them is Masteron, Drow Standalone, was prescribed for breast cancer, okay? Because it was found to have a downregulatory effect on circulating estrogen. The theory is that it has influence on the liver that specifically causes changes in binding proteins, which takes a certain amount of estrogen out of play and potentially uh, skews. There's also... a uh, well, boy, there's a lot here. There's and and in regards to estrogen, there's actually many different deviants of estrogen. Almost all blood tests focus on E2, but there's actually a lot of variants and uh, downstream derivatives of estrogen, much like there is of testosterone, where testosterone can become, you know, all these various um, metabolites, if you will. Estrogen has the same series of cascade. It's actually a little smaller than it is for testosterone, but nonetheless, it does exist. And the, the suggestion is that it actually skews the percentage of what variant is produced, and those variants have different uh, affinities to different tissues, lowering the affinity to breast tissue, for instance. So it's not so much that it lowers total estrogen, but it lowers the influence of estrogen on that specific tissue. That is what I suspect is the strongest influence, but it does seem to have a total lowering effect, not big, but real, and probably a skewing within the, the family variants that affects action at target tissue, which is really the biggest thing. It doesn't matter so much what your total estrogen is. It's much more important as to whether or not you are or are not getting you know, cancer or you know, you know, breast tissue growth or et cetera. So that is uh, what I could tell you on that without, you know, really breaking out some books and studying up for the answer. But uh, it, it seems to be uh, driven at the liver level, and it seems to be largely an enzymatic effect on 
what derivatives are produced. Uh, much like, by the way, also uh, Proviron does the same thing to a, to a uh, similar degree. There's an argument at, at foot, actually. Um, Tony Huge from Enhanced Athlete is much bigger proponent of uh, Proviron than Mastron. I am the other way around. We both have our reasons, but um, it's, it's equally effective. And depending on where you live, it might be easier to get, easier to dose. Uh, we're coming up on the hour mark, so I'm going to start thinking about wrapping up. Uh, although here's an interesting question. What are my thoughts on using HCG along with AAS through the cycle? Uh, I think if your concern or your background concern is fertility, might be a good idea. Does it have any real effect on health at large? No. Uh, does it have any effect on the actual ambient hormone levels in, rel in relevance to exogenous testosterone? No. Uh, the only place I would find any validity for that is if down the road you fertility is a proximal concern because if you stop the damn drugs and just wait long enough, your fertility will come back. But if you're looking at you know a kind of a timeline type thing, keeping the you know testicular axis stimulated via you know a secretagogue or you know a luteinizing type hormone, uh, yeah. But in general. To most athletes, fertility is not the biggest deal, and it just is, it's another drug. You're taking another thing. You're spending more money, and you're really not getting any performance benefit out of it. Uh, personally, I don't think it's a great idea, uh, like I said, unless fertility is super relevant to you. And quite honestly, again, it's not for me to suggest – you know, kind of moral, ethical type shit because mine are way skewed. But my general attitude is that if fertility is that big of a deal to you, you probably shouldn't be fucking taking drugs. That it's kind of kind of the way I feel about that. Um, yeah, so probably not the answer you were looking for, my friend. But uh, I have a hard time being anything but you know direct and honest. That's kind of how I feel about that. But in general, my attitude is if, if fertility is not a big deal, I wouldn't do it. It's just more money and more drugs. And if fertility is that big of a deal to you, I would question whether or not you should be taking drugs. So uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I'll answer this one here also. Um, TRT clinics typically prescribe secondary hormones, progesterone, DHEA, et cetera, alongside the main hormone. Does this have any relevance to athletes? Uh, no. Keep in mind, TRT clinics are shooting for that middle of the bell curve, keep everything in harmonious balance, protect their ass, don't get sued. And I have no problem with that. That's a great idea, both for them and the people they're treating. Uh, is that the, the, the window toward greater you know, human performance or, or maximal human performance? No. As a matter of fact, maximal human performance a lot of times is breaking that harmonious balance and you know, getting something out of line. You, know, you grow super physiologically because you have a super physiological this thing or that. So... Um, in general, no, it's not the way you would go about it for athletic performance, but for health, long-term survivability, probably not a bad idea. Probably not the perfect idea, but they're not in the business of perfect. They're in the business of, you know, making money, not getting sued, not killing you. And that's definitely where they're at with that. So that, that's, yeah, that's, it's workable. It's completely workable, but no, I wouldn't, you know, worry about fiddling with those kind of micro managements as an athlete uh, in general athletes overcome with you know, brute force sheer volume of brute force um, so with that uh, the little ticker tells me yep we've just crossed the hour mark and uh, audience is dwindling a little bit uh, but I do want to thank everyone for fucking being here and doing this uh, I always enjoy this and I get the feeling that most people out there enjoy it in response so with that, I am going to wrap up for the day. I will be back on this forum uh, in exactly one month, the first Sunday of next month. And uh, I'm trying for, I wanted to do say this earlier in the thing, but I just got excited and launched into shit. Um, very scattered. I am. Uh, I am trying to kind of dial in on when I want to do or when I should do, it's not even really when I want, it's just when I should do some Instagram live videos. I did one uh, last yesterday, yeah, yesterday, Friday, no, day before yesterday, uh, Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time U.S., 
6 p.m. Eastern Standard, same time zone as New York, Philadelphia. And I think that's what I'm going to try and shoot for. Um, I actually have a scheduling conflict, so I have to fiddle with my schedule to make it happen next week. But I think that's probably the good time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. That gives me 8 a.m. Saturday morning in Australia and somewhere in the middle for everybody ensuing. So in, you know, in, in the middle there, you know, England, South Africa, the other places that I have strong audiences. So I think that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, I hope to finalize that this week next, get that posted on Facebook so people can remember it and recognize it. But uh, again, the only reason I'm doing that is because all you guys are interested. So thank you. And I do appreciate it. I don't mind uh, giving my time. Don't mind giving my opinion. And uh, until next month, stay strong. <laughs>